If God exists, then God created everything. Everything, right? That's what most people believe. But I'm bothered. Questions trouble me. Did God create out of nothing? Absolutely nothing. Suppose there was no beginning to the cosmos, the universe going through endless cycles. What then? What about the rules of logic? Or the existence of numbers like two or five? Philosophers call these abstract objects, and they seem to exist without any cause, not needing a creator. I have lots of questions. So what does it mean to say God is the creator? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my way to find out. I start with a Christian philosopher and apologist, known for his work on creation, time, and natural theology, William Lane Craig. Some say Bill gives the strongest defense of how Judaism, Christianity, and Islam view creation. That God created the universe from literally nothing. Bill, we always hear that God is the creator. Okay, sounds simple. But what is the creation? Well, I think the doctrine of creation means that God is the source of all reality outside himself, that apart from God, everything else has been brought into being by God. Now, what is everything else? It would be all physical, concrete objects. It would be time and space themselves. It would be any realms of spiritual reality that you might believe exist, such as angels and other spiritual beings. And it would include any sort of abstract objects, if you think that those sorts of things exist. Like mathematics, two plus yes, two like equals four. Or... Sets and numbers and propositions and, and so forth. So uh, everything that exists owes its being to God, and I would say was brought into being by God at a specific time, which implies that the creation or the world or reality outside of God has not always existed. I think that most people don't understand that the idea of creation is inherently bound up with temporal considerations. These things are not just dependent upon God for their being, but they were brought into being by God. Creation, properly speaking, is, as I've defined it, bringing things into being from nothing. Now, in addition to that, initial act of creation, theologians have typically talked about God's conservation of the world in being, that is to say... Keeping it going. Yes, that he preserves them in being. And were he to withdraw his conserving power, the world would be annihilated. It would vanish in the blink of an eye. It's more of a passive action. It's just yeah. ceasing to maintain it. Is that distinction uh, important? Yeah. Hmm. Is it important? <laughs> you threw me for a loop. I think that by thinking of annihilation as the withdrawal of God's sustaining power, rather than as an active act of destruction, it underlines the contingency of the world upon God in a way that exalts God's power and majesty. Whereas if the world has some sort of positive inertia yeah, yeah. in being on its own that would require God to blast it out of existence, that would tend to make the world less contingent on God, more independent of God, and therefore would perhaps be thought to diminish God's greatness and power. So in that sense, it perhaps highlights a, an important difference. If we accept that indeed God, the Judeo-Christian God, created the world from nothing. What do we learn from that? The doctrine of creation out of nothing underscores the distinction between God and the universe. 
It means that it undermines all attempts to divinize the world, to say that the universe is necessarily existent, eternal and divine. Now that is surprisingly a conclusion of momentous significance because apart from the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, there really is no doctrine of creation out of nothing in the other major world religions. Think of the pantheistic religions of the East, Hinduism, uh, uh, Buddhism, Taoism, or polytheistic religions of uh, ancient Rome and Greece or other uh, societies. In none of these do you have a robust doctrine of creation out of nothing. So that if the doctrine of creation out of nothing is true, it serves to distinguish the Judeo-Christian tradition from all of the other world's religions, including pantheism. What else would it say about God's own internal characteristics? It's hard to imagine any other doctrine that would underscore God's omnipotence, his uh, self-existence, his necessity, his distinction from the world, in a way that the doctrine of creation out of nothing does. If there is good reason to believe in creation out of nothing, either through philosophical argument or scientific evidence, this provides evidence for the existence of God that would otherwise be lacking. Typically, atheists have affirmed that the universe is eternal and uncaused and it's just there and or that's all. caused itself in some way. Yes, or is nece necessary in its existence. The demonstration that the universe is not eternal in the past points to the contingency of the universe and to its grounding in a supra-natural cause which transcends space and time and brought it into being. So if there is evidence of creation, I think this will be some of the most powerful evidence for the existence of God that has ever come to the fore. God is the creator of everything. All that exists comes to exist because of God. Furthermore, Bill claims, God created from nothing. All created things have existed for a finite time no thing other than God has existed forever. But what does from nothing ex nihilo really mean? To find out, I go to Berkeley, to the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences, to meet its founder, Robert John Russell. Bob is a minister with a doctorate in physics. He seeks creative mutual interaction of science and theology. The Judeo-Christian creation story ex nihilo, God creates out of nothing. Is it relatable to science? Well, modern cosmology, Big Bang cosmology, talks about t equals zero. Absolute, which means that there was a period of time which... Absolute beginning of time. The absolute. Absolute beginning. Let's say that's true. Let's say science says it's true. Is that relevant to ex nihilo creation? And uh, some folks say it's directly relevant. It's almost a proof or a support, right? The opposite view is it's totally irrelevant, that science and religion are in separate worlds and they simply don't relate, and to try to relate them is to confuse them. And if you do take some latest scientific theory as supposedly proof, it's, it's an right. artificial exactly. uh, similarity and, and, and it would be confusing and distorting to, to, to make that connection. Or married today, widowed tomorrow. When science <laughs> changes, you've, you've lost your connection. The simple way to say it is that what creation ex nihilo, I don't think, really means is that without God, there wouldn't be in the first place, no matter how it came about. And for someone like uh, 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 Aquinas, in the 13th century, it was very clear that the basic meaning of ex nihilo was this philosophical contingency that the universe couldn't exist otherwise than God. And so when you say creation ex nihilo, which, which, which literally means from nothing, right. it, it, it is not implying itself a, a t, t equals, equals zero, no. that there was a beginning no. of time. It means right. no matter what you got, right. God has to sit beneath it. Exactly. Remember, Thomas was dealing with Aristotle's cosmology in which the universe was eternal. Right. right, fine in the size, but eternal in, 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 te in time. Right. And he said that's fine because even that universe isn't self-explanatory. 
right? Just because it's eternal doesn't say why it exists. How it exists as eternal isn't why it exists as such. Right. All I want to say is the indirect relevance starts with the fact of existence, then says within that, if there is a beginning, it sort of adds more support, more layers. I call it, in a court of law, I call it a character witness, not an eyewitness, <laughs> right? It gives evidence towards the fact that this universe looks like the kind of universe that would be created by God, but it isn't the reason why I believe in the, the universe is created by God. I believe in that because I believe in God who is the creator. <laughs> For Bob, to defend God as creator, the priority is, first, the universe exists, with or without a beginning. And then second, if there is a scientific beginning, it strengthens the God argument. I was taught, and always assumed, that if God exists, God created from nothing. But then I heard about a different way of thinking. It came from a quantum physicist at Cambridge who became an Anglican priest. John Polkinghorn. We meet in the Queens College Chapel. John, when I think about God as a creator, it is completely unsatisfying to me just to make that statement. I really feel I have to try to know everything about how that can happen, mm -hmm. both as a mathematical physicist and as a theologian. How do you think about God as the creator? Well, I think the first important thing is to recognize that calling God creator isn't answering the question, who lit the blue touch paper of the Big Bang, who started it all off. Creation is, not, is about why things exist, not how they began. Uh, when Stephen Hawking produced his speculative cosmology that suggested that though the universe has a finite age, it has no datable beginning, and then went on to say, what role then for a creator? That was Steve being pretty naive, I, I have to say. Um, Why so? Because God's role is, is to hold the universe in being. God is as much the creator today as God was 13.7 billion years ago when the universe, as we observe it today, sprang forth from the singularity of the Big Bang. So that uh, it isn't getting things going. At the end of his book, Stephen says, who breathes fire into the equations and gives them a universe to describe? That's the uh, question that is answered by saying, the will of God lies behind the order of the world. So to speak about God as, as a creator is to say that there is a divine mind and a divine purpose underlying the whole of cosmic history and related to the, the whole of cosmic history. And that could, would have been true, uh, could have been true if the universe in fact had turned out to be a steady-state universe without, without a, a, a beginning of any observable kind. So you see no theological state, stake difference between a Big Bang theology and a steady-state no theology? No fundamental difference. No, I, I think that, 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 that's right. I, I think that uh, the, that was never, never an issue. So you see God's involvement on a continuous basis Absolutely. as yeah. much as, if not more so, yeah. than at one time Yes, I mean, I, I believe. I mean, it, I believe that if God did not will the world to remain in being, the world would disappear. I mean, it's not an experiment I can do, obviously, uh, fortunately. Uh, but um, that, that's how I that's how I see it. So it is a, a a continuous, active process that that God. Well, I think that God of... interacts with creation in two ways. One is simply holding it in being. That's the sort of fundamental, and that's the transcendent aspect of God, if you like, the God who is the the ground of being. Um, but I think also God is imminently active. I mean, God isn't just holding the world in being, waiting to see what happens. The God interacts with the unfolding history of the world. There is a God of providence as well as a God of creation uh, who acts, acts through history. One of the arguments against God as the creator says that if you look at the incredibly large number of galaxies, hundreds mm. of billions mm. and hundreds of billions of stars in every galaxy, right. this enormous universe, and that if, if life is just rare on Earth, that it seems like a profligate God would create <laughs> all of this just for our little island of self-consciousness. Well, you could stand that argument on its head and say, gosh, you know, it's so important to have self-conscious beings, God-conscious beings, that God is prepared to lay that on. And one of the insights is actually that if all those trillions of stars weren't there, we wouldn't be there to be possibly upset at the thought of them because it's only a universe that's as big as ours which can last the 
13.7 billion years, which is necessary for the coming to be of self-conscious life. There's a natural time scale for it. So even if we are the only uh, self-conscious life or, or any life in, in the universe, which we don't know whether that's yeah, true or not, sure. but um, it, it, it would still mean that those stars aren't redundant. They are the necessary uh, part of the whole process. And, and then the argument becomes God made all of that just for us? That might be so, or may, God may have made it for little green men as well. I mean, I, I don't think there's any theological stake in, in saying that, that human beings are the only uh, self-conscious, God-conscious beings in the world. I mean, we can allow God a certain generosity, both in the resources that God deplies and the, and the purposes God is trying to fulfill. Well, they use the vast periods of time and yeah. the vast utilization of matter and energy yeah. seemingly way out of proportion to what has been created. But who are they to say what's in proportion? You know, Pascal said, Pascal was thinking at the time when people were just beginning, beginning to realize how big the universe is, and he said he was frightened by the thought of those eternal spaces. But he also said, human beings are just reeds, insubstantial beings in this vast world, but we are thinking reeds, and that makes us greater than all the stars, because we know them and ourselves, and they know nothing. And I think that the size and significance are certainly not the same thing. God sustaining the universe, John says, is more significant than God starting it. And God participates actively in the unfolding of his creation. But I am still bothered by those abstract objects, logic, numbers, or the presence of possibilities it is now true that I might quit my job. Or ideas like morality and goodness. It is never good to torture babies. Abstract objects would seem to exist, even if no concrete objects ever existed. which would mean that abstract objects exist independently from God. So wouldn't abstract objects disqualify God as a complete creator? I recall my discussion with Bill Craig. So that means if you have these abstract objects, numbers, existing necessarily, meaning that God didn't create them, that is uh, that is detrimental to the, the fundamental concept of the Judeo-Christian God? Right, it would be incompatible with the Judeo-Christian concept of God, which thinks of God as uniquely self-existent. Ah, so now if we have something else that's self-existent, then God is just one of an innumerable number of abstract or something things, and just God is part of this Panoply. You said it exactly right. It would literally be innumerable. Infinities of infinities of infinities. Of things. Of, uh, of things that exist all independently of God, which compromises both God's self-existence and also his creation of everything else out of nothing. It would mean, in fact, that most things are not created. So, as a Christian theist, you got a problem. Right. Well, what do you do about it? Well, I remember when I first encountered this issue, it, it struck me deeply. I thought this is a dagger at the heart of my faith in, in God. This is a serious objection that I had never encountered before. Wow. A dagger at the heart of Bill's faith in God. Do abstract objects really undermine God? To find out, I go to Oxford. I speak with Brian Lefto, professor of the philosophy of the Christian religion, an expert on the deep mysteries of God. Is God the source of abstract objects? How could that be? Absolutely everything comes from God. Absolutely everything depends on God. Nothing was a given for God. For us, there are always things we just inherit. For God, he inherited nothing. It all comes from him in some way or other. Now, that would include, obviously, the concrete things, matter, energy, space, time. 
But we're aware of more things than that. We're not aware just of colored things, but also of colors. Uh, not just of a pair of glasses, but of the number, too, which is the number of frames that are in the pair of glasses. Uh, we're not just aware of sentences, we're aware of truths those sentences express. Things like properties, i.e. colors, things like numbers, things like truths, are grouped together and called by philosophers abstract objects. Abstract meaning not concrete. Right, not material, uh, not involved in causation, not located in space, probably not located in time either. Uh, it's plausible that there are these abstract things as well as the concrete things. And so when you believe that God is the source of absolutely everything, you have to ask the question, is he the source of those also? Now, one obvious response to the question is, who cares? Well, I mean, you know, we're, we're worried about the matter. We're not worried about the numbers. Well, if God didn't create those things, if he's not in some way behind them, then they stand independent of him, and in a way they're superior to him. Uh, How so? God, well, God has to learn about them, he, uh, and God depends on them. For example, uh, if there were no property of being divine, God couldn't be divine. He wouldn't have the property to be. If there were no property of omnipotence, God couldn't be omnipotent. There'd be no thing for him to be. So God derives his very nature from the abstract realm if it's out there and independent of him. So in that sense, God would be um, a, a pawn, if you will, of these perennial <laughs> concepts that existed prior to God in some uh, 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 causal sense, um, and, and, and these properties would be superior to God. Right, and they might in fact constrain his, his activity quite a bit. I mean, one of the properties that God has by virtue of his nature is perfect goodness. Perfect goodness could severe constraints on what God can do. So if perfect goodness is something independent of God, which God simply, so to speak, has imposed on him as part of his nature, uh, it and the rest of the abstract realm comes first. God comes second. It's as if they put grooves in reality and God had to roll down one of them or the other. It's not really up to him what he does except within narrow limits. If God is really the ultimate reality, if everything traces back to God somehow, then those things trace back to him too. They're not outside him, they're rooted within him. That sounds like circular reasoning because you're saying, assuming that God created everything, therefore he would have had to have done this. Let, let me reverse it on you and say that if there were no God, which you don't think is possible, but some people do, so no God, would two and two still equal four? If there were no God, absolutely nothing would exist. That's what's involved in saying that God is the creator. If you want to trace even mathematics back to God, then you have to say, yes, if there were no God, two plus two would not make four. They wouldn't make anything else either. There wouldn't be anything for the number two to refer to. There would be an absolute nothingness. But notice we're talking about an impossible situation here. I mean, I believe that God exists necessarily. So to say that two and two don't make four, that's an absolute impossibility. Right. Equally, it's an absolute impossibility that God not exist. The one impossibility is rooted in the other. So your concept of God as a creator really is what I could call a strong concept in that God truly is the source of all things. Right. Right. Uh, to me, there's nothing abstract as well as nothing concrete that's independent of God. Why this is interesting is that it's probative of, of the coherence of the concept of God. Because if, if you can't resolve some of these uh, intricate ideas, you know, m maybe the whole idea of God doesn't make coherent sense. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if God exists, it has implications for every part of reality, and all those implications have to hang together and make sense if the idea of God is going to hang together and make sense. The question of God as creator is rich and vast. If God does exist, it probes the essence of God. If God does not exist, it reveals incoherence, perhaps contradiction, in the concept of God. There's the factual question of whether God created from nothing, whether there was a point when, other than God, nothing else existed. Next, if God is sustainer, is more fundamental than God as creator, both God and cosmos change.
then those pesky abstract objects like numbers and logic, whose necessary existence seems stronger than God's existence. Do abstract objects sabotage a sovereign and free God? Imagining how God could be creator helps inform whether God could exist. And if God does exist, how God works. Is all this closer to truth? For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. <laughs>